Well, good morning, everyone. I'm David from Fallon Rosa Online, welcoming you all to another Tuesday morning reflection with the upcoming retreat leader, and that retreat leader is Carl McCullman. He'll be speaking about Julian of Norwich, a very little known Christian mystic um, that has a lot to offer us today in our shelter in place world. Uh, Carl McCullman is a contemplative writer, speaker, teacher, soul friend, and storyteller. He is the author of numerous books, including the Big Book of Christian Mysticism, Answering the Contemplative Call, An Imitation of Celtic Wisdom, and Unteachable Lessons. Carl's work has been warmly endorsed by many leading voices in the Christian spirituality field, such as best-selling author Brian McLaren, who said, if you don't know about Carl McCullman and his work, you should. Carl studied at James Madison University, received a BA in English, and George Mason University, where he received a master's in professional writing and editing. His formation in the spiritual life includes training with the Shalem Institute in Washington, D.C., the Institute for Pastoral Studies in Atlanta, and the Monastery of the Holy Spirit in Conyers, Georgia, where Carl is a life professed lay Cistercian, that is, a lay person under formal spiritual guidance with the Trappist monks. In addition to his writing, Carl has a full-time ministry as a lay retreat director, speaker, and contemplative teacher. He and his wife co-direct the RCIA process at their local parish. He is a commissioned center in prayer presenter with the Contemplative Outreach of North Georgia and a spiritual director serving individuals both in Metro Atlanta and online. Carl's writing appears on numerous websites including Pat Patheos, The Huffington Post, Day One, Contemplative Life, and Medium. He regularly posts new content to his personal blog at carlmccoleman.com on topics such as Christian mysticism, contemplative practice, Celtic spirituality, and interreligious dialogue. Carl co-hosts the Encounter in Silence podcast with filmmaker Cassidy Hall and theologian Kevin Johnson. That can be found at EncounterInSilence.com. Carl and his wife, artist friend Nicoleman, live near Atlanta in a small house, in a small house, excuse me, filled with cats, books, icons, and love. Their daughter Rhiannon passed away after a long illness at age 29 in 2014. When they take a break from the work they so enjoy, you may find Carl and Fran wandering around the mountains of Western North Carolina or taking long walks along the Emerald Coast of Florida. And uh, with that being said, I will hand you over to Carl and you can sign up for this retreat at valambrosa.org slash calendar and click it on uh, this Friday and Saturday. Um, they'll get you signed up with the event right, right there. So uh, that being said, Carl, please take it away. Hi, I'm Carl McCollman, and today I want to reflect with you on why Julian of Norwich matters, why Julian of Norwich matters. And we'll begin by looking at what Thomas Merton had to say about Julian of Norwich. He says, Julian is without doubt one of the most wonderful of all Christian voices. She gets greater and greater in my eyes as I get older. And whereas in the old days I used to be crazy about St. John of the Cross, I would not exchange him now for Julian if you gave me the world. He finishes by saying, I think that Julian of Norwich is with Newman, the greatest English theologian. Now that's high praise indeed. But Merton calls Julian a theologian, and that may not be the word that we often associate with her. If we go back to the Catholic Encyclopedia, we find a word that is much more commonly associated with Julian, and that is the word mystic. Now, mystic and theologian do not have to be mutually exclusive, and the argument can even be made that to be a good mystic, you need to be a theologian and vice versa. But I will say that, you know, in our day and time, we often think of theologians as dry and dust academics whose writings are barely relevant to us ordinary mortals. Meanwhile, most of us aren't even sure what a mystic is. So let's unpack this word mystic, this concept, before we talk a little bit about Julian. So mystic is not a mainstream word, at least not in mainstream Catholicism. It never appears in the Bible, nor does it ever appear in the Catholic Catechism. So we'll turn to a secular source, the Oxford English Dictionary, defines mystic as, quote, an exponent of mystical theology, 
one who maintains the validity and the supreme importance of mystical theology. And then it goes on to say, one who seeks by contemplation and by self-surrender to obtain union with or absorption into the deity, or one who believes in the possibility of the spiritual apprehension of truths that are inaccessible to the understanding. The best known 20th century writer on mysticism was the British writer Evelyn Underhill. She defines a mystic like this. A mystic is a person who has, to a greater or less degree, a direct intuition or experience of God, one whose religion and life are centered not merely on accepted belief or practice, but on that which he or she regards as firsthand personal knowledge. So let's unpack this. A mystic is a person who practices contemplation, self-surrender to experience union with God. Someone who believes it is possible to spiritually apprehend truths that are inaccessible to ordinary human understanding. Someone who has or has had a direct intuition or experience of God. And finally, someone whose faith is centered not merely on dogma or doctrine, but on firsthand personal knowledge of union with or the presence of God. I'm reminded of the Anglican theologian uh, J.I. Packer, who wrote a book in 1973, became a bestseller called Knowing God. And you could say that a mystic is someone who is not as satisfied just with knowing about God, but who wants that direct personal knowledge of God for himself or herself. But as the Oxford English Dictionary and Underhill point out, mysticism involves even more than just an experience of God. It implies an intuitive knowing, a knowing of something that cannot be put into words, insight into that which is inaccessible to the understanding. And this, I think, leads us all the way back to the original Greek root of this word mystic. Now, I don't have, I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't have enough knowledge of Greek to really give you any, you know, certainty about how to pronounce this, but I always pronounce it as muo or mueo. The original Greek word basically means to shut or to close or to conceal. Now, I know you can't always trust Wikipedia, but this line from the Wikipedia entry on mysticism is pretty good. It's derived from this Greek word muo, meaning to close or to conceal. Mysticism referred to the biblical, liturgical, spiritual, and contemplative dimensions of early and medieval Christianity. During the early modern period, the definition of mysticism grew to include a broad range of beliefs and ideologies related to extraordinary experiences and states of mind. So I mentioned that mystic or mysticism never shows up in the Bible, but it's related to a word that is quite frequently used in the New Testament, and that's mystery. For example, St. Paul speaks of the mystery of Christ. This comes from kind of the pagan notion of mystery religions, religions that were initiatory religions in which the initiate would often be taught some ritual or ceremonial secrets that only the initiates had access to. But in Christianity, this notion of mystic secrets is, is seen in a slightly different way. It's the secrets of God that through Christ are now made manifest. So the mystic secrets, at least in Christianity, are accessible secrets, accessible to everybody. This root word is also the root for the Greek word for initiate, as in the initiate to a mystery religion. In this sense, this sense survives in modern Catholicism with the notion of the Easter Vigil, which offers sacraments of initiation, baptism, confirmation, Holy Communion to people who are seeking entry into the church. Interestingly enough, in the Eastern Orthodox uh, branch of Christianity, the word for sacrament that gets used, that often gets used, is the mysteries. So again, this preserves this ancient idea that when we experience the sacraments, 
we are given something that cannot be put into words. And we are ushered into the very presence of God. So what I'd like to do now is reflect with you on uh, this notion of mystic or mysticism. And I, I want to look at two contemporary authors that, um, I say contemporary, they're both, uh, one of them still alive, both from the 20th century, uh, who, um, who have something to say about mysticism and its role in Christianity today. And I think it's well worth reflecting on. The first one comes from the, the Jesuit theologian named Karl Rahner, who was a um, significant presence in the Vatican II Council. Rahner died in the early 1980s, so almost 40 years ago now. And he is quoted, in fact, this is one of his most popular soundbites you'll find on the internet. He's quoted as saying, the Christian of the future will be a mystic or will not exist at all. The Christian of the future will be a mystic or will not exist at all. And I think it's important to note that he, he said this, he wrote this about 50 years ago, about half a century ago. And we know we're living in a time when church attendance is dropping and when especially many young people simply are no longer interested in the institution of the Christian religion. So many people say, I'm spiritual, but not religious. And so I think that, that Rahner was kind of prophetically pointing out this reality, that, that we're living into a time when the institutional dimension of religion just isn't cutting it for many, many people anymore, and where, where people both inside and outside the institution are really finding meaning is in this, this kind of mystical heart of our faith or of our tradition. So this leads us to the second quote, which comes from a Benedictine monk, uh, Brother David Stendhal Rast, who says, the mystic is not a special kind of person. Each person is a special kind of mystic. And I think this is really important. Remember, if we go back to that Oxford English Dictionary a definition of mysticism, we remember it talked about how in the modern era, there was this kind of idea that mysticism became associated with supernatural states or extraordinary states of consciousness, supernatural phenomena. We think of uh, Teresa of Avila levitating or of Francis of Assisi getting the stigmata. And I think this has led to the idea that mysticism is not something that, that is available to the ordinary person, the average everyday uh, person who's interested in living a more spiritual life. And so I think uh, Brother David's, uh, his quote here is a healthy corrective to that way of thinking, that there's no one size fits all uh, Christian mystic or mystic of any tradition, really. That mysticism, this idea of having that that heart to heart uh, experiential encounter, embodied encounter with the living presence of the divine, that cannot be put into words, that cannot even be fully comprehended by our thinking mind, that that's available to everyone, but it will be a different experience, a different encounter for everyone. Now. The mystics have always been with us. Every generation has its mystics. From the New Testament to the present day, Christianity has always, always produced women and men who exemplify the mystical dimension of spirituality. Uh, well over a hundred figures who we think of as the great mystics. And, and what makes a mystic a great mystic is usually that they, that they were writers, theologians, philosophers, poets. They left behind a body of written work that, uh, that spoke of their mystical uh, relationship with Christ. And of course, that literary work has become renowned and, and has been read generation after generation. You don't have to be a writer to be a mystic. Um, but the ones who kind of have become the, the A-list, I suppose you could say, that has been a quality that, that you generally see, is that they've written either their, their personal autobiography, their confessions, their, their personal story, or they have been poets or teachers who have wanted to share their mystical experience with others. But like I say, we see this every century, every generation, that there have been uh, people who, who live that kind of deep spirituality and then are capable of articulating it for others. Uh, many of the great saints of the Christian tradition are renowned as mystics. St. Francis of Assisi, St. Augustine, St. Therese of Lisieux, John of the Cross, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Hildegard of Bingen, Bernard of Clairvaux, the list goes on. 
There are other renowned figures that are generally regarded as mystics who are not necessarily thought of as saints or who the, the, the Catholic Church has never formally canonized. Uh, examples would include Meister Eckhart, the German uh, theologian from the Middle Ages, Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk of the 20th century, uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the, the Jesuit scientist who is also very much a mystic, Simone Weil from World War II, Carol Hauslander, 20th century British author, and the figure I want us to focus on, Julian of Norwich. Now, why should ordinary people like you and me care about mysticism? And why should we care about the great mystics of the past? After all, if what, what Karl Rahner and, and Brother David are saying to us is that we have to find our relationship with God, our encounter with the divine, why should I worry about you know, some woman who lived 600 years ago, 650 years ago, uh, that she had a remarkable encounter with the divine? And so I would encourage you to think of it this way. Great musicians learn their craft, not only by practicing their instruments, but also by listening to the recordings of other great musicians. Great artists study the techniques and the masterpieces of previous masters. So we turn to the mystics, not in a vicarious way, not thinking, well, they had this profound encounter with God, so that lets me off the hook. But rather, we turn to them for inspiration, for guidance, for insight knowing that their message is always going to be, you need to see this for yourself. So Julian of Norwich. Julian was a medieval mystic. She lived in the 14th into the early 15th century. Obviously, from, from her name, she, her home is Norwich, England. She was a visionary. One night when she was about 30 years old, she received 16 showings over about a 24-hour period. Showings just being the medieval English uh, expression for what we, we might call visions or revelations. She eventually embraced a life of consecrated solitude associated with the Church of St. Julian in Norwich, England. And that's where she gets her, her nom de plume, her pen name. We actually don't know her real name, but her literary name comes from the church that she was associated with. Julian wrote one book. There are two different versions. There's a shorter version, which most scholars think was written first, and then a longer version, which may have been as many as 20 years after, after that night in which she had her visions. Her book is very simple. It tells the story of her visionary experience, but then also the lessons she learned from them, her reflections on their meaning. Julian, of course, as, as a 14th, 15th century figure, writes in Middle English. She was the same, same language that Geoffrey Chaucer, who wrote the Canterbury Tales. He was a contemporary of hers. It's not, uh, it's not horribly difficult to read, but you probably need to have a glossary and, 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 and some willingness to kind of sound out some of the more unfamiliar words. So generally speaking, Julian's uh, text is being translated into a contemporary English, again, so that those of us who are not necessarily language scholars can still access her wisdom and her, and her writing. Now, some of you may be wondering, why isn't Julian a saint if she's this great mystic? Why isn't she a saint? Well, the reality is, is that in, in the Catholic Church, when saints are canonized, the church is interested in the person, and they really want to have a sense of the person and a sense of their life and their story. And we just, we just don't know very much about Julian at all. Like I mentioned, we don't even know her name with any certainty. We don't have a firm birth date or death date. There are no church records to speak of. Uh, you know, she is really what I would call a mystic's mystic in that not only is her visionary experience pointing to the hidden things of God, but even her very life is a hidden life. So, so we have her book. That's really what, what Julian was interested in. She wasn't interested in writing about herself. She was interested in pointing to her visionary experience of God and the, and the spiritual, theological, and mystical lessons she learned from the, that uh, visionary encounter, and then how she could offer that to us for our reflection and our inspiration. So, of course, uh, 
I'm giving this little talk in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and I like to say that Julian of Norwich is the patron saint of sheltering at home. Uh, she's become a little bit more visible, I think, during, during this, uh, this time of pandemic because of the circumstances surrounding her life. We know that she lived in solitude most of her adult life. She was what was known as an anchoress, which basically means somebody who lives a consecrated life of solitude, oftentimes associated with an ecclesiastical building, in Julian's case, with the Church of St. Julian in Norwich. She actually had a small cell in which she lived, which was attached to that church. Julian is also kind of the patron saint for this moment in history because she was a survivor of the bubonic plague. She lived through the, the, the horrible outbreak of the plague that has been called the Black Death, the years 1348 through 1350, when it is believed that the town of Norwich could have lost anywhere from a quarter to a third, maybe even half of its population that it was just, just devastating in terms of how the infectious disease uh, decimated the population. But Julian lived through that. She was a little girl at that point, maybe only about seven or eight years old. But there were other outbreaks of the plague uh, during her adult life as well. Her age, the, the 14th century, it's been called the calamitous 14th century. It was an age of war, of pestilence, of religious strife, of peasant uprisings. So Julian um, lives through all of that, and yet her theology, her spirituality is profoundly optimistic. Her most famous, famous line, her most famous quote is simply, all shall be well, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. And it is that ringing optimism that makes her so attractive to us here in the 21st century. Here's some more praise for Julian of Norwich uh, from Richard Rohr. Uh, Julian's interpretation of her God experience is unlike the religious views common for most of history up to her time. It is not based in sin, in shame, guilt, fear of God, or hell. Instead, it is full of delight, freedom, intimacy, and cosmic hope. High praise indeed from one of our uh, most beloved living spiritual writers. So simply to summarize, Julian of Norwich, an obscure medieval woman spiritual writer, has received high praise from the likes of Thomas Merton and Richard Rohr. Her claim to fame is simply that she was a mystic, a Christian, although mystics come in all the great traditions, but in her case, a Christian who has had a sense of a profound encounter with God and whose teaching encourages us to seek a similar embodied spirituality in our own lives. Mysticism has, for the past few centuries at least, been marginal in the Christian world. But, but figures from recent decades like Karl Rahner and, and Brother David Stendhal Rast see it as an essential part of a vital and revitalized future for the church or for the Christian uh, community as a whole. And I would even go so far as to argue that really for the human family, that this mystical kind of heart-centered spiritual excuse me, spirituality, is really what we need at this moment in time. Now, Julian is only one of many, many great mystics, but she is especially helpful for us in our time, at this moment in time, because of her life of solitude, surviving the plague and maintaining a spirituality of profound optimism. And that makes her a really important and, and trustworthy guide for our time. So, if this has piqued your interest, I hope you will explore Julian of Norwich in greater depth. Thanks for, um, thanks for joining me today and for reflecting on uh, mysticism and on Julian of Norwich, this amazing medieval teacher. Once again, I'm Carl McCullman. You can find me online at www.anamkara, that's A-N-A-M-C-H-A-R-A.com. Thanks. Bye now.